Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Storytellers. Uh, tonight, uh, we have some special guests. We have a twofer. We have the wonderfully talented uh, Wheezy and Walt Simonson here to talk to us about uh, their storytelling techniques, uh, how they approach visual storytelling, and a little bit about their career and their background. Uh, should be a lot of fun. So let's get us started, and we'll first bring Walt in. There he is, the oh, man of the oh, hour. Oh, holy cow. <laughs> <laughs> Yikes. Welcome, Walt. Glad you could make it. Well, nice to be here. Uh, the answer right now is I look at Graham Nolan stuff. I just swipe all of it, and that's how I tell my <laughs> stories. Thanks for coming. We'll see you guys later. Ah, I think Walt's nose is growing, so <laughs> we'll have to deal with that untruth. But There we go. Uh, and we'll, we're waiting uh, just a sec for uh, Wheezy to show up. Uh, she has to run upstairs to her office and get squared away, so it'll be a couple of moments. No worries. Do you have any you know questions you want to ask right now before she's on? Now's the time to do it. <laughs> well, I want to I wanna show uh, the fans something here. Uh, hold on a second here. Okay. Ooh. This comic book was a seminal comic for me. I bought is one of the first comics uh, I ever bought is the first Batman comic I ever bought. And I end up uh, having a long run on detective comics. Now I got to be friends with Jim Aparo, who was the uh, illustrator of this cover, which just drew me in. It was so awesome. Okay. The frontispiece was done by a future teacher of mine and my mentor at DC comics, Sal Amendola. The main story was written by our friend Archie Goodwin and illustrated by your, your old uh, roommate, Howard Shaken, who Howard was a, a guest on my show uh, a couple weeks ago. We had a wonderful time, and you, know, you had popped in and saw some of that, too. Then I was also exposed to this cat for the first time. This was, uh, this was Walt uh, early on. Uh, when he and, and Archie were doing Manhunter. So how's that for a, an awesome intro into uh, into comics? It's huh? a great intro. I feel very old. <laughs> <laughs> now, what was, your, what was your first year in the biz as a professional, Walt? 72. I came to New York in August of 72, right at the beginning of the month, uh, in okay. order to try to get into comics. That's what I wanted to do. Uh, if I had not done that, I haven't the faintest idea what I'd be doing now. Working at McDonald's, probably. And uh, did you get you start like doing like a house of mystery and those kind of things uh, for Joe Orlando or? Uh, more or less. Um, I When I came into New York, I went up to D.C. You couldn't do this now. I think I had set up an appointment. Um, and I went in. I talked to a couple of folks. Uh, and it didn't really get any traction. So uh, and I've told this story elsewhere, but I'll tell it again quick. I'll try to do it quickly. Uh, I went at the time, D.C., they were on well, Lexington Avenue, I think, 3rd or Lex, Lex, I believe, or 909 3rd. I think that was it. And they had a coffee room. I think later floor space became so expensive, nobody had a coffee room. But that time in 72, they did. There were some vending machines with awful coffee and stale other stuff. And uh, the day I walked in, uh, I went in there because I didn't. I I talked to a couple of editors and been sort of said, "Well, eh, go back and keep practicing, or what else can you do, or stuff like that." One of those guys was Archie Goodwin, by the way. And um, so I was depressed. I had my portfolio. I wasn't sure what to do. And I went um, went to the coffee room. Look who I joined us. Hold on a sec. Oh, there she Hi, is. Louise. Hi, how are you? I'm, I'm telling my boy how I got the comedy. There we go. There you are. Is that better? Yep. Yeah, you're good. So I I went into the coffee room, and Howard Chaikin, Bernie Wrightson, Michael Kaluta, and probably either Dan Green or Alan Weiss. I cannot remember, and they're not sure either, so uh, it's a long time back. But they were all sitting around the table shooting the breeze. Uh, I introduced myself. I'd met Howard very briefly about a year earlier at a convention in Washington, D.C. And, you know, so I was trying to get the comics. I hadn't, wasn't successful yet. And they said, well, let me see, let's see your portfolio. So I showed them the work I had. It was a science fiction strip called Star Slammers that I had done when I was in arts as my degree project in art school. And um, 
Kaluta liked it, and he said, well, let me show this to this old guy behind us. He probably didn't say old guy. And the old guy was probably in his 40s at the time, I suppose. But uh, it was Jack Adler who was in charge of the, or second in command of the production department. And as I learned after Jack died, I wish I'd known it, he colored the first Superman. He also invented the system of coloring we all used up to the advent of computers. So wow. I showed it to Jack. Jack liked it. Jack, so let me take this and show it to Carmine. And that was Carmen Infantino, who was the editorial director, publisher, whatever he was. He was the main guy. I knew Carmine's work. I'd read, I read comics. Mm -hmm. So he took the portfolio, and he came back at the dead run a few moments later, and he said, Carmine wants to see a let's go, as if it were one word. And I found myself in Carmine's office. I do not remember much of that conversation. Uh, I do know that he asked me if I were influenced by Bernie Krigstein. I was not at the time. I didn't really know Krigstein's work. But seeing it later, I could see what Carmine wondered about because why he wanted it. It was very linear. It was very designy. So a lot of it was. And uh, Carmine liked my work. And the result is that he called in three of his editors and made them all give me a short story. So Archie Goodwin, who turned me down very, very politely a few minutes earlier, and of Joe course. Orlando and um, uh, Julie Schwartz all gave me short stories. Back then, comics, DC Comics, there were a lot of comics with short stories in them, as ba either as backup features or the horror mags that you know were all short stories. Mm -hmm. So I ended up getting stories in a one of the Superman books and in a Weird War comic and in a war uh, uh, all star well, Star Spangled War, one of the one of the war books that Archie did. I've forgotten the name offhand. And I did the one for Weird War. I did first. That was Joe Orlando. Um, I did one for Archie. I think Julia Schwartz and I, without ever having to actually discuss it, let that job slide gracefully into the distance without bringing it up. Because I think the work I was doing was absolutely antithetical to stuff that Julie liked. And and honestly, he was kind of putting out stories I wasn't crazy about either. And I was, <laughs> I was you know, smart ass enough with no jobs under my belt to think that. So I didn't insist. But what happened was Archie liked the job he'd given me. It was a science fiction job in line with what I had shown in the portfolio. There were a few science fiction jobs in the backs of comics then. This is before Star Wars. So science fiction was kind of a small little area down in comics someplace. And I did a couple more. He, he fed me a few more stories. Mm -hmm. And he fed me enough stories to keep me alive. I could pay my rent. I could buy hamburger helper and occasionally a hamburger to go with it. And, um, you know, after about six months in the business, I had done several jobs for Archie. Uh, including I'd begun to do jobs that were not just science fiction. And about six months into the business, Archie got a hold of me and he said, I'm taking over Detective Comics as the editor. They'll be writing it. I want to do a new backup feature in the back. I don't want to do Plastic Man or, or uh, the Elongated Man. I guess that was it. Elongated Man, stuff like that. It's going to be called Manhunter. We want to keep the trademark for that name at DC. And we need to publish stuff from time to time with that name on it. And uh, would you like to draw it? And it was a, at the time, it was an ongoing backup of eight pages uh, every two months, which I could barely make. I barely was able to draw eight pages every two months. I'm not sure how I stayed alive. But I did do that. And, and that work was really what broke me professionally. Um, it broke me into the business. Before I began doing that work, I wasn't that well. I was, you know, I knew the kids, the other kids right. like me, Howard right. and Bernie and Kaluta, all the guys that I'd met. But after that work was done, it took me a little over a year. It was that we did seven issues. Archie left the company. So we wrapped everything up in a final crossover with Batman. We used all 20 pages of the story to do right. a long story at the end. And Archie took off. But at the end of that, we had won some awards for that work. And by the time we were done, every editor knew who I was. And really, I didn't have to looking for work again. I was offered to work from that point on and was able and was lucky enough to get work I wanted to do. So it turned out pretty well. That's very cool. Um, Louise, uh, what was your inspiration for getting into uh, comics and visual storytelling in, in, in general? Um, your generation and mine, I'm a few years younger than you, uh, there was no money in this business. <laughs> so it wasn't the lure of fame and fortune. Uh, there was something, there was some catalyst, there was something that hits all, every one of us. 
that says, this is what I want to do for a living. And what was that, what was that uh, aha moment for you? Uh, I don't know if there was a specific aha moment. I, um, I had been working in, I, okay, I liked words and I liked pictures and I did like comics, um, but it never occurred to me to do them. However, I had met a batch of people who worked in comics and I liked those people. Um, I had a friend who worked at Warren Publishing and she said, there's an opening there that you can do and it pays better than your job. Why don't you apply for it? So I said, okay, sure, why not? You know, so I applied for it and uh, it was in the production department at Warren. Um, and, you know, it, it was, you know, I don't know, art corrections and um, lettering corrections and that kind of thing, which, I got I got the job, but I honestly just really wasn't that good at it. But I also I was enthusiastic and willing to do anything that needed doing. Um, you know, a letters page. I can write letters pages. I can write advertising copies. I can do all sorts of stuff. Um, the editor didn't have an assistant. And um, and about a month or two after I was hired, they just created an assistant editor position and moved me out of production into editorial, and I loved it. I mean, I I I loved it when the editor was gone and I got to be the editor. Um, you know, I loved it when finally the editor left and I could demand that I got to be the editor of those books. I just I love doing it. I love doing comics. You know, yeah. I love the interaction of little words and pictures. I love working with the people who do that kind of work. I just thought it was, it was just the best. Um, but I really didn't aim at that the way St. Walter did or a lot of other people do. I kind of, you know, fell into it sideways. And I knew I wanted to be in some kind of publishing, but you know, I, I didn't, I had never, it, comics had never occurred to me until my friend said apply for a job at my company. So see, it was, was, that, was that 72, around 72 for you? Oh gosh, was it, honey? I never. Seventy-four. 74. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, I no, never know. Warren, I do Walters does. <laughs> Warren, Warren Publishing. Uh, it was some of the best stuff came out of Warren in the nineteen seventies. Um, you had Archie Goodwin writing uh, stuff. You had uh, Steve Ditko doing the best work of his career. You had Alex Toth. You had uh, there's just a litany of of talent that was working at Warren. And I'm curious what that was like. What was what was was that uh, was that primarily driven by Jim Warren, uh, the uh, the direction of the books and stuff, or did that fall more into the daily editorial cha uh, that was, chain of command? Well, that's sort of hard to say since you know any kind of creative endeavor like that, and communally creative endeavor, is everybody throwing in their bit. Um, it was partly it was. I mean, Warren, Jim Warren was all for it. Um, he loved having really good people working for him. Mm -hmm. I mean, he had real talent, I think, for noticing, for grabbing hold of talent early. Um, so that, you know, when Bill DeBay was the editor before me, and he had actually had a whole batch of very good people on the books and then before he left even. I mean, he did had that wonderful Jennifer story that uh, Bruce Jones and uh, Bernie Wrightson did. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Rich Corbin, he had done, he had a lot of really good people. Um, yeah. And then when I came on the books, I was able to bring in, a, I guess, more American talent. Um, he, Jim Warren loved uh, working with the Spaniards. He had a really, a good relationship with um, Celex and Estradas in Spain, um, mm -hmm. Josep Tutain and his stable of artists. Uh, and so that Jim liked working with those guys, but he was, Jim Warren but was perfectly amenable to bringing in other people. And then um, uh, when I was the editor, he hired uh, um, Carmen Infantino, who, you know, was Walter's, who got Walter into the business, essentially. Um, right. Carmine had been let go as the publisher at DC. And I think Warren loved having the publisher of D the ex publisher of DC working for him. Working for him. <laughs> so he, he told him, he said, okay, here's the deal. Uh, you, you can just, you will give you space in the office and a drawing board and you can draw 
as many stories as you can draw as you want to do. So he was very fast and he kept doing tur churning out our stories. I was <laughs> he used to supply him with these plots and he would he would turn turn them out. And then but the, the problem was of, of course that Warren is an anthology or Warren books were anthology books. Mm -hmm. And he wanted the different stories, short stories to look different, which meant hiring a getting a batch of different inkers um working on those books to to you know, anything from Alex Nino to Walter to oh I don't know I don't even remember who all we John got. Seven did one I think who yeah. did one well? I think Severn may have done one of those oh, oh yeah I'm sure he um, did um yeah I think you know pretty much anybody who could everybody wanted to do at least one Carmine story and some of you wanted to do two or three which was nice so um you know I and in that way I was able to to bring in more of the more American artists into the book. I think that hadn't necessarily been there before. So it was, it was, um, you know, it was kind of great actually. It was a, it was really nice. Um, Warren would go away every summer and it was during our busiest time when we would put out, you know, uh, extra size, size issues and annuals and all of that. And he would come in to the office maybe twice over the summer, he would come in and he would say, why didn't you use red instead of white? This is terrible. Ah, and we'd have to, and we would say ceremonially, it was totally ceremonial. Oh, sir, you are our Lord and master. And of course, you know best. Um, we, we will learn from you. And then he would go away and then we would do whatever we wanted for another, you know, month and a half or two months. And, uh, it was, I don't know, it was a wonderful experience. I had a huge amount of freedom. I could do, as an editor, I could do all sorts of fun stuff that, you know, I wouldn't have been able to do in a larger company. I really, you know, I tell kids today that if you can work for a small company that needs people to yeah. do stuff and you learn so much and you have so much fun, it's sort of more fun in a way than working for a large company. Well, Not as creative, but you know, and that's part of the the creative uh, need is, is the freedom to create. You know, with less restrictions, and uh, I. It sounds like uh, you know working there. You know, you, you you guys could do some. Well, plus you you weren't under the uh, comics code authority because you were a magazine. That's right. So that also you know offered you some extra lines of freedom that you couldn't uh, necessarily, stories you could tell there that you couldn't normally tell at DC. Oh, there were stories that I kind of, I'm looking back on them thinking, what was I thinking even allowing myself to publish those? But you know what? There's some good stories. I had some really good writers too. Yeah. I mean, Bruce Jones was really good. Um, Roger McKenzie was good. Um, mm -hmm. You know, some just people who were, you know, good at what they did and I enjoyed them. Mm -hmm. Now, Walt, um, you've, you write a lot of your own work, uh, but you've also written for, for other artists. Uh, do you approach writing differently when you are writing for yourself versus writing for that you know that somebody else is going to uh, uh, illustrate? I don't know that I do exactly. I mean, the thing is that I, I prefer working what used to be called Marvel style. Uh, it's not so much. I think it's very rarely done now. There are a couple of folks that do it, but almost no one does it anymore. There were DC. There was DC style, Marvel style. The idea was DC was doing a complete script. Uh, that's what Howard does. He would you know page one, panel one, description of the panel. Here's the dialogue, panel two, and so on, all the way through. Marvel style was here's the plot. Give it to the penciler. Send me back twenty pages. Or in the old days, twenty two of uh, all broken down. And I'll write the script from your drawings. Mm -hmm. um, for me, that's the best way to do comics. Um, it, you're working without a net. Uh, Howard's wrong. Sorry, Howard. And <laughs> he's not here. What does he? What do I care? Um, <laughs> but it it has to me. It has more vitality. Uh, I mean, Howard would not be. He would be the exception. But there or there are a lot of writers who. Do not write visually. A lot of them write. There'll be these long conversations, a lot of people standing around talking, stuff like that. I just don't find that very interesting. But I'm an old Marvel guy from the, you know, from as a reader from a million years ago. 
So I really prefer the Marvel style. And I've, I've written a couple full scripts maybe twice in my career. Mm -hmm. um, very rarely. When I have, I've done what Archie used to do. I, I picked it up from Archie. Oh, I, I went back and figured it out. I hadn't thought about it at the time. But Archie would frequently, I don't know if he did this for every script he wrote, but he would actually thumbnail the job on his little, you know, where my, where's my fingers here in the camera, on eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper, one page per, or a little smaller actually, uh, one page per sheet. Uh, and he was a good cartoonist. They were very loose. They were not tight drawings at all. Mm -hmm. He would break it down panel by panel. He would write his script from that and then send the script off to the to a write, uh, an artist if, as needed. Um, in my own case, uh, I don't, I do a little bit. Of, I mean, say in Sal Buscema's case, Sal and I did work on Thor together. Sal was an old pro at doing Marvel style. That was a long time ago. And, and there are a lot of artists now that I think have never done it that way and don't really understand how to break stuff down very well. I um, agree. But, but Sal was, you know, his brother John was a better draftsman. John was one of the two or three best draftsman comics ever had. Yeah. And Sal's quite good, but he's not, I mean, nobody's in that league. Jose Garcia Lopez is about the only other guy I could think of off the bat. There may be yeah. a few of them now. People in are all better than they used to, the actual draftsmanship. But but Sal was a master storyteller. He could put pictures together in a very classic way and tell the story economically, dramatically. It was really it was a treat to write. And I just didn't run into problems with that. So I would give it the stuff to Sal. I would. I just wrote it as if I were going to be drawing it, and I got back really beautiful storytelling from Sal that I, I treasure the time I spent working with him. We had a great, we had a great fun on those stories. I did one story with an artist who shall remain nameless, um, not for any bad reason, but I, I did an ending that, if I had thought about what the artist's strengths were. I would have redone the, I would have rewritten the ending in a somewhat different way, not quite as out there as I did. Um, I mean, it still came out fine. I wrote it fine. One of the things when you work Marvel style is you discover you can write almost any crap an artist gives you and make it work. Um, you know, it's better if this artist knows storytelling. But you really, makes sense. What's that? And the visuals make sense. And the visuals make sense. I've, yeah. I've seen some visuals that have not made sense. And yeah. that's difficult to... Uh, where, where the dialogue has to explain what's happening in this yep. long-winded piece of exposition. <laughs> well, yes. we, had a, we did a story together, we and I, called Meltdown. And John J. Muth and Kent Williams painted it. It was yeah. Wolverine and Havoc, or Havoc and Wolverine. Jay did all the Havoc stuff. Kent did all the Wolverine stuff. I don't think either of them will be offended if they come across this. But we had a sequence where Wolverine, we, we separated the characters. Wolverine's out in the Mexican desert searching for Havoc, who's been kidnapped, or whatever happened to him. I've forgotten now. Um, he finds a cabin, just a really shanty, and goes into it. And somewhere in the shanty, on a, sh on a shelf over there, he finds some coins. And one of the coins is a ruble, which is not like a Mexican coin, which is significant in the story. And Kent, who did brilliant work on Wolverine, I loved his Wolverine. He had these long... His hair came out like his like his like horns. It was great. I draw Wolverine. That's the way I want to draw him. And uh, he did his picture of searching around the cabin. But by the time the page is over, there wasn't a coin in sight. He'd never put a coin in there anywhere. So I, I bet he didn't have ruble reference. He probably didn't have a ruble reference. That's probably right. So we ended up, you know, one of us. I don't know which one. We wrote it together, back and forth and back and forth. And it's just I could not tell you who wrote what anymore, but the reason I wrote it together. And we put in a balloon where Wolverine's standing there, and, and you get a balloon that says something like, wait, what's this? A bunch of coins. And look, a ruble <laughs> or something like that. And I'm willing to bet dollars to donuts that very few readers read that and thought, there aren't any rubles in here. There aren't any coins in this page. Nobody, nobody saw that. One guy saw it that I know of. I'm walking down the halls of Marvel Comics one day after that book has come out, and I pass Archie Goodwin. And Archie just says, as he walks by me, he just says, nice catch on that ruble. <laughs> so Archie, he didn't miss anything. Oh, no. He totally got it. He understood exactly what we'd done. 
And and really, nobody reading that thought there aren't any coins here. So you can write a lot. And I've seen I've seen art that was way less comprehensible than that, way less comprehensible that my wife has been able to write because she's had some stuff where she's had to really do some backing and filling. And she's done a brilliant job with it. And I no one reads those comics and thinks, boy, she did brilliant work to get this together. And Archie, I saw Archie in the DC office. This is on Marvel stuff. And I saw Archie in the DC office and he said, good job. He said, no one will ever know. Because <laughs> <laughs> Archie is the best. He was the best. <laughs> so, so I really, you know, I, I just enjoy working on a net. I really enjoy doing comics that I way. We are doing a story right now. I don't know if it's been announced that I'm working on it, so I can't tell you what it is right I don't now. Even, I don't know that it's been announced that I'm doing it. Oh, maybe not. Maybe Wheezy neither. We're working together, which is kind of fun. And uh, I just did a, I, I, a couple of uh, parts of two pages. You can where, tell us. We're all friends here. Yeah, all nobody's right. watching. Nobody's no, watching. Nobody's going to rat you out. Well, uh, <laughs> I, uh, somehow, in reading Wheezy's script, it was kind of a script plot together because Marvel now wants full scripts. Um, and so, uh, but I still took it and kind of went where I wanted to go with it. Yeah, right. you know, the quote was, you got the gestalt. That's right. That's what Weezy called the other. Walter gets the gestalt. <laughs> he loved it. He thought that was so funny. <laughs> so, I, but after I look at the pages, once I finished all, all of them, the layouts for all of them, I came back and I hit this one sequence. And I went, man, this doesn't make any sense. And I'm not sure what I was trying to convey in the layouts from Weezy's plot. But I have to, tonight, after we finish talking, uh, I was looking at the clock there. Uh, I'm going to sit down. I will probably clean out two of those pages, uh, well, half of each of those pages, and redraft that sequence in some way that makes more sense with those characters. I kind of tried to do what was there, but somehow I didn't really understand it, I think. I didn't really right. figure out the the sequential material in a way that actually could work. Now, honestly, I have every confidence that if I just gave it to Wheezy and said, write this, she would be able to. She'd write it in a way that made me look brilliant. But really, I look at it without the words. I'm going, I was not brilliant on this <laughs> on this particular page. So I'm going to go back. So when you're done here, what you're saying is you're going to go back and start drawing rubles on the page. Well, I may draw rubles. I may add a ruble. No, I should. I've never done that. I should do a comic where I just stick a ruble in the corner or something. Stick a ruble in the corner. Absolutely. Just, you know, Reed Richards cool. just grabbed it with a teleportation device right. and looped around. You know, honey, you should hold up one of the pages of one of your scribbles so that like, people can see how maybe you might not quite know what you had drawn. Well, they might figure out what the job is. That if uh, I do that. Well, oh, yeah, maybe they would. Yeah, you're right. Darn. Well, I, do, I do. What I do is I do very loose layouts on the page. I, I draw... I do my layouts originally on typewriter paper. Well, copier paper to you younger guys. And uh, one sheet per page. And uh, that way uh, I can go through. I can make changes. Uh, one of the things you learn, there was a John, uh, John Le Carre just died recently, mm -hmm. a few days ago. And Tinker Tailor's Soldier Spy is one of my favorite books, one of my favorite novels. Loved it. And in it, he has a conversation with a couple of characters where one of them is discussing, it's probably Smiley, talking to the guy that Bernard Hepton played in the uh, series. I can't remember his name in the, in the book. But he's talking about faked disinformation, fake photographs, stuff like that. And he notes that the more you pay for a faked photograph, if you're buying it from the other side, the less inclined you are to doubt that it's spurious. The more you invest, you you can't afford to uh, to think that it's you know that it's wrong, and so right. now I forgot where I was going with this. I, I lost it again. Um, I just I found let's see X uh, book. Uh, well, this will look this will look great on my resume. I want it. Um, <laughs> scribbles. But, uh, You're talking about your scribbles. Ladies my, and gentlemen, my, we're watching the collab. Well, I do occasionally. Oh, yeah, oh, I'll I'll get scribbles. <laughs> If I just do scribbles, I don't have any problem erasing them or throwing them out. Right. If I had done a full page of tight pencils, I would hate to get rid of it. Right. And if I had something going wrong, I would fight like crazy to try and bend it around to make it make sense. When I'd be much better off taking an eraser, going, or taking a piece of paper and just tossing it in the, in the recycling bin and redoing it. So my layouts are very loose. Um, 
Weezy's learned to write from them. And so she'll write them. Uh, I'll trace them off full size. Again, incredibly loose. Um, and then usually, well, in the old days, and sometimes even now, when we get the work lettered in the boards, actually inked on the boards, um, I will do these loose layouts. I will take the thinnest, cheapest tracing paper I can find. I will tape a piece down on top of the boards, and I will spot all the copy, which is to say I indicate on the page where all the copy is going to go. Mm -hmm. um, when that's done, and I indicate you know, where the balloons are, I indicate which panel borders I want to be solid, which ones I want left un uninked, because the letterer, for those of you who don't know this, the letter in the old days would do the, all the lettering, display lettering, titles, I mean sound effects, titles, balloons, and do all the borders. The balloon right. borders, the panel Background borders, signs. all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I would, I've worked with John Workman primarily because we've just, we work together very well. And so I'll indicate on the tracing paper where I want solid balloon, uh, uh, panel borders. There'll be some place I want, I want the panel like a balloon left open against the border. So there's no, there's a white space there going into the gutter. Uh, there may be an effect I want, like I've got a guy leaping out of a panel. I don't want the line drawn across where he's going to be. And because I haven't really drawn it very well as to where he's going to be, I indicate on the paper where I want John to stop the panel border. And then if I need to fill it in more, I can do it myself later. But I'll send that off to John, um, and we'll come back, all these very loose layouts, but all perfectly lettered with all the sound effects, all the titles. And that way, if I've misjudged the size of a word balloon, which happens occasionally, mm -hmm. um, and it goes over a guy's head like that, I just redraw the head over here or down here or somewhere else because since it was so loose, erasing it is no problem. And then I recompose. So essentially, once the balloons are in, I can tweak my compositions and recompose stuff as mm -hmm. needed in order to get the best effect out of my drawing and the marriage of the words and pictures, which is one of the things I like best in comics. I like having the words, having the pictures, and having them work together. I miss that. I miss I miss the uh, uh, the lettering on the page. Uh, a, you don't have as much work to do because <laughs> the lettering is covering up a lot of stuff you got to ink. But that's right. You know, but when you're looking at the original art, it is that marriage of words and pictures, um, and it, it seems like a complete piece of art when you, even if you don't know the context of the story, if you're looking at a a, a random page and it's got lettering, balloons, and stuff on it, I, I just love to read it and try to you know, make up my own story or, or wonder what's happened, what happened before and what's happening on the next page, you know? Well, there, there's something compelling about pictures and words together. A million years ago, when Archie and his wife, Anne, lived in the city, uh, they were up on the west side. And in the bathroom, they had shower curtains. And the shower curtains were a half dozen or more daily strips from very early Milton Kniff, Terry and the Pirates uh. in color. They you know, solid, flat colors, but they were that. And I don't know how many times I was in that bathroom communing with nature and sitting there reading the strips over. I read those strips a million times, but yeah. I, there was just something there. The fact they were there, they had the words, they had the pictures, and I just I read them because it was such a treat yeah. every time I was there. So yeah. I do think that. I find that. I mean, I, I do a book called Ragnarok now for IEW. My editor, Scott, will be very glad I put this in here. But I'm able, I'm grandfathered in that work to getting it lettered on the boards. John Workman's lettering it on the boards. And so it's a treat for me to be able to work, to still work that way in an yeah. industry where there's not that much of it. There are a couple of, Tommy Lee Edwards does that when he can. I think John Paul Leon, both of whom are phenomenal artists, yeah. uh, do that as well. But it's not, you know, it's not at all common. It's rare now for people to be able to do that. I started working digitally a few years ago, uh, doing the art digitally. Um, I've got so many pages in my studio and stuff. It's like, I don't need any more artwork in here. I need to, <laughs> plus there's, there's a, uh, there's an expediency of it too. I don't have to scan the artwork. It's already done, uh, cause it's done digitally. Um, oh, I right. move things around, uh, uh, very easily. Um, I just did a, um, a, a, a wraparound cover uh, for a, a project I'll be launching uh, in January. And it's got all kinds of elements on it. And I could do the elements separately and then move them as necessary. 
to get the proper compositions and stuff. And uh, I do like that, but I also miss the the tactile feel of of actually working with ink on a board and paper and scratching things. And, you know, I, I do miss that too, but you know, it's one of those things is commercial art, you know, I, I got to get it done. And, you know, so I, I have to make uh, <laughs> allowances, I suppose. I'm too old. Screw that. <laughs> I'm, I'm still doing mine on the boards. I will say when I was doing, speaking of the layouts, the uh, thumbnails, um, if I have something I want to change, either I'll erase it and redraw it, or I'll have some other way of doing it. And I'll just cut out a sheet of a piece of paper. And I'll lay it down, I'll redraw the panel the way I want it, and I'll just tape it down. So some of my layouts, some of those thumbnails, will have two or three layers of paper all taped together and redone until I get where I want to be. And when I'm tracing it off, I've got a light box right next to me, a Xerox machine behind me. When I trace it off, or maybe when I'm getting ready to pencil it tight when I've got the lettering back, uh, I may resize things. And if I do that, I'll take my layout or my some pencil I've or structure drawing I've done, and I will put it in the Xerox machine, change it the size I want it, and then I light box that off. I'm using, I use the light box for a lot for to get that. But I do it very often when I'm doing covers. I will do my stuff the way you describe, only I'll do it in an analog form, not Annually, in a virtual. Annually, yeah. I, will, I just did a cover that had about five figures on it, and I drew little or same size figures on separate sheets of paper for each of the people who are going to be on the cover, and then light box them in. And then I can adjust them and move them over. I go, oh, this guy should be a little bit bigger. I make those changes as I go. So by the time I've got to the final pencil stage, mm -hmm. I have gone through a lot of paper. John McGann have referred to my lifestyle as paper intensive. And But I will be able to pretty much get the design where I want it, the mm -hmm. shapes where I want them. Shapes are very important to me in the work I do, apparently. Mm -hmm. I, I spend a lot of time worrying about them. So mm -hmm. that's how that that. I kind of do what you're talking about, but in act on actual paper. Sure, sure. I used to do the same thing, light boxing and, and and moving things around. It just this seems to just move a little bit faster for me. Uh, Louise, uh, do you still get a thrill when you send a script in and you see the art pages come back for the first time? Of course. Um, you know, it's very exciting, actually. You know, you you imagine a story in your head. I know that when I when I write a story, I see the action almost like movies in my head. Mm -hmm. And um, I I usually, if, if they let me, and if I'm working with an artist who's comfortable with it, I, I love doing it Marvel style as mm -hmm. Walter does. Um, I think you get better pictures that way. Um, but you also get more surprises. Like, the, you know, the artists will, you know, give you reaction shots and, Oh yeah, there you go, John. Um, they'll give you reaction shots and all sorts of cool stuff. Um, wonderful images in in ways that you that I really hadn't imagined. Um, you know, uh, you get somebody like John Bogdanov there, who's um, I mean, he's just a master of all sorts of of stuff. You know, down shots and up shots and reaction shots yeah, and really. you know, large burly figures that you know just. Um, they it kind of explode with emotion in a lot of ways. Yeah, very um, very dynamic and powerful. Oh yeah, John John does emotion and power. That's what that that's what his his aside from the fact that he's really a really great gra draftsman. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it's just it, you know the stuff you get back quite often is is breathtakingly wonderful. So yeah, I, I'm always thrilled. Now, have you ever gotten stuff back where you're like, oh Christ? This <laughs> You can write anything. I have gotten stuff back where the story was kind of semi ignored, and you know, some uh, 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 the artist, the penciler, would go off in his own tangent or you know have his own agenda that he was was promoting, and you know, I, I that was there again. That was the story. What one of the stories where Archie said, "No one will ever know." Because he knew that the story that I was telling wasn't necessarily the story that was being drawn. Right. But it was a story that had been approved. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's that kind of thing that, that happens to me very rarely. Um, my experience with, I mean, I, I, when they let me choose, and I most often get to choose who I work with, um, I choose smart artists. And when you get a smart artist, you know, three quarters of the job is done. 
You know, you, you tell them a story. And a lot of times, there's most, a lot of artists don't really want to know all of the details. They want to know what happens. Um, and, you know, how people feel. So I'm feeling a little bit of dialogue. My, my plots are not uh, very highly detailed. Um, there are enough to make, to put pictures in their heads. And with will, let me jump in really quick. I will say that Wheezy, much more than I do, Wheezy is extremely good at writing to the strengths of her artists. She really will tailor her plot. Oh, yeah, I do that too. To what, to what the artists that she's working with will be able to, are able to do. Mm -hmm. And in a way that oh, I don't do as much of that. I mean, but it's it's really like, good. you know, Walter, well, you just want the action, right, honey? You I want the choreography. I the choreography. I want the choreography. And then I'm good. That's all. I, I mean, I think part of the confusion where where there was a page, a couple of pages that you 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 drew that you were not happy with the sequence that you had put in, yeah. was because in trying to accommodate the editor, who is a total sweetheart and I love him, um, has I I I actually wrote a full script, but to, uh, with the with the understanding that it would be treated as if it were as a plot because I wanted him to be comfortable and he wanted me to be comfortable. And I think it confused what you were trying to do. I think your brain got, yeah, I'm not got quite sure what happened there. It it in with it or something. So anyway, it's not a big deal, but, um, I know, uh, John Bog liked to know, he wanted to know what people were going to say, sort of more or less, because he wanted to be able to draw their emotions that they were feeling. Um, Brett Blevins, New Mutants. What? Were you full script on, on the Superman stuff with him? Oh, no, 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 no. I, John, John's a smart artist. You don't want, he doesn't need full script. Okay. Um, why would you tie his hands like that mm -hmm. and tell him what to draw? He doesn't need, he, he, he's a director. He can be his own director. That's right. Um, We're giving Brett Blevins story. But Brett Blevins wanted to know what, you know, we did the New Mutants together and he wanted to know what everybody was thinking and feeling at all, all times. I mean, Brett's phrase, and I loved it, was I like to draw the characters so they look like they're thinking something. <laughs> and they always did. He did the, he, these wonderful little gestures. I mean, throwaway gestures that you, that I would never have thought to, certainly I would never have asked for. You know, there's a picture of, of uh, one picture that Walter loves where Ileana is um, sitting back, uh, lying back in, and, and her chair with her, 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 her desk, I guess, with her feet up on the desk, and she's got her head back. And she has a pencil. Oh, stuck. A pencil. Like, yeah. as, we've like, all done as kids. Like kids we never thought about drawing. Um, yeah. And that was yeah. just, you know, it was just just the jet, again, it, this, a really smart artist who understands personality, and there's personality in every single gesture that his mm -hmm. characters do. Also, yeah. Brett was so brilliant at putting people in a real um, environment, and mm -hmm. then no matter, in a, often a very complex environment, and then moving the camera, and the characters were always standing where they had been. I mean, I just kind of blows my mind that you can even think in that direction. So I, I could never have um, instructed someone to right. draw like that. You know, just it was just some piece of brilliance that he has. And you yeah, know, I'm working, I'm working with Brett right now on a project. Uh, are you? Yeah, uh, yeah. he's uh, Isn't he uh, great? a great director with him. Yeah, I, I created a series for um, for um, Aftershock, and, and Brett's illustrating it. And uh, I, you know, when the pages come in, I I asked you if you get excited. And and when the pages come in, as as an artist, you know, I had my own ideas of how I would lay things out, mm -hmm. and I worked full script. I, I I described everything and stuff like that. And then Brett would take an entirely different angle on it that that maybe I described, but it's still he he brought he brings across the intent of the yes. imagery and yes. uh, and as you said he, he's wonderful at nuance and and personality and his figures his his body work and and his backgrounds and i'm just i can't wait till uh, aftershock announces this thing which will be pretty soon but uh it, it's going to be amazing and, and brett is just he, he blows me away he's so good i know he is he is really good and he's he's he was, he's one of the prodigies I've worked with. I, I loved working with young artists um, because they're completely fearless. So that Brett was, I think he was maybe 20. Mm -hmm. I, when I was an editor, I hired Brett 
uh, I, for uh, to, to do Dark Crystal. And I, he must have brought in Dark Crystal samples or something. Wow. Um, he was living, was it in Arizona at the time? Nevada, maybe? Can't remember now. Brett will tell you. Um, <laughs> Uh, and you know he, he he was he drove to New York with his wife and a bringing his stuff with him in a trailer. I mean it was pretty cool. Um, he was but he was one of the prodigies. He was so young to be to have such a developed talent. I, Bernie Wrightson was another one. Is so he, Art Adams. Art Adams was another one. So those are the three people I've worked with who I I think were prodigies. Just you know brilliant from the moment they were that I first saw them. Anyway, and I saw them when they were very young. <clears throat> Yeah. So Brindley Brett was always like that. And he's never, he's only gotten better over the years. So I think you're lucky you're working with him. You lucky W. <laughs> well, I feel that way. Uh, now I know what Chuck Dixon used to say to me. He says, make me look like a genius. Yes. When he send a, a script in. And, and, and I, I say the same thing now to if, if I'm working with an artist on a project that I'm not illustrating, you know, that I, I might be writing, you know, I just say, make me look good. You know? <laughs> yeah. That's all I ask, you know. I mean, I Will Eisner we'll used to say when, when the script goes to the artist, the, the story is now the artist's story, not the writer's. And uh, I, I, I embrace that that idea uh, when I'm working as an artist as well. That you know, I try to tell the story with the intent that the writer had, but to enhance it and make it better than mm -hmm. maybe what he was thinking it was, it was going to be. Um, and uh, I. So, like, even if it's a full script, I may change things, but to get the intent, you know, I might change the panel numbers or the arrangements sure. or anything, any of that stuff. You you have the freedom as the artist to tell the story visually. And uh, I think that's a, a, a lot of younger artists don't have the confidence to do that these days. You know, that they think if you're working full script, you're locked in to, the, you know, everything that's being described, you know, and afraid I will say on that score. Um, I have found different writers. Uh, usually, the writers I've worked with on full script have usually told, often told me, "Just draw whatever you want. You know, just here's the script and do it however you want to do it." And I found some writers where trying to do anything other than kind of the way they blocked it out just doesn't work for me. I kind of have to do what they've got lined up, which is less interesting in some ways for me. But it's really the best way to tell the story. Um, on the other hand, years ago. I had a chance to work a couple times with Michael Moorcock, uh, who wrote the Elric stories and mm -hmm. wonderful fantasist and science fiction writer uh, and a wonderful writer. And also he became a good friend. And Mike's stories, his scripts, they're full scripts. They probably, they might not be as long as an Alan Moore script. I wouldn't, I'd have to sit down and compare them. I don't know, but they're pretty elaborate and they're pretty, you know, I almost felt like there was no point in doing the comic. They should just take the script and print the script the way it is right now. And it would just be fabulous. But they were full of information. And yet somehow, in, and, and Mike said, just you know, draw whatever you feel will work. And somehow I found that work to be full of freedom, full of choices I could make that I thought made the story work. I will say that I, we were doing it the second time. We were doing 48-page comics. And for each, it was four 48-page comics, Elric, The Making of a Sorcerer. And I really felt that I could have done each one of those 48-page books as a 96-page book, and it wouldn't have felt like filler. Mm. It would have felt like it was. So I, in some ways, I felt I was kind of cramming stuff down to get it into 48 pages. But, but I didn't have any problem just choosing moments I thought would work and keeping what I hoped was the spirit of what Mike was writing without necessarily following every direction he was giving me. And I don't know why that, I couldn't tell you why it worked like that. As I said, there are other writers I've worked with where really I try to do other stuff and I'm going, no, that's just not working. I got to, I got to pretty much toe the line to get this to come out the best I can make it. You know, I, I may be that some, some kinds of writing puts pictures in your head in ways so that you get a variety of images or a moving image maybe in a way that the, the, some scripts give you only static images. Well, it's, it's certainly true. Mike's writing for me is incredibly visual. 
just amazingly visual. So, I mean, there are more pictures than I could possibly draw right. for a 48-page comic. But I can choose them. I can choose right. pictures I want to include. But, I mean, I had one where uh, he, I don't remember what they were called. They were these creatures, uh, kind of like large praying mantises or insects. Mike's going to kill me. But uh, that was years ago, years ago, Mike. But they were, they were, I think, sort of in New Orleans. And there were all these streetcar tracks. Remember, they used to be embedded in the roads of cities. That's mm -hmm. why I grew up in Washington, D.C., near Washington. That's how the streetcar tracks were. So I'd seen them. They were there when I was a child. So all these tracks come in, and there are all these streetcars that have come in as these, whatever they are, getting off. And just beyond New Orleans, this is as I'm remembering it. If I'm wrong, don't shoot me. Uh, just beyond New Orleans is where the world ends. Everything drops off there. And it's this vast realm of chaos at that point from then on. So I got to draw one panel full of embedded tracks, streetcars, the Terminal Cafe, which is where they were all headed, little tiny versions of these creatures, and a kind of Jim Steranko effect in the background where you could see where the world ended and chaos began. And that's not something you get from every writer you work with. So <laughs> it was a treat to, it was that kind of stuff. And I'm sure I simplified it from whatever Mike had asked for. Right. But it was really, but it was, his stuff was so visual that it was very inspiring to actually work on. I'm afraid right. I'm not really, I'm not decadent enough to do a really, a really good Elric, I'm afraid. But, but I did the best I could. I'm sure it was great. Let's see. We have a question here. Uh, Fred Chamberlain wants to know, what is each of your favorite professional works from your spouse? Oh, Lord. Let me see. Hmm. In, in Wheezy's case, I mean, I have several. I would choose X Factor because I got to draw those. So I <laughs> have a lot of fun there on those. Um, Brilliant. And I, and I, and I, this is not one of those, oh, your old work was better, which we, if you work in comics more than six months, you hear that from somebody. But I will say, I loved Power Pack. And I partly loved it because it was such lovely art from June Brigman, who was a complete novice when she began mm -hmm. doing that book. Mm -hmm. And it was really Wheezy's first series and her first long, long form writing in comics. And they hit the ground running so beautifully. And that book, of all the books I think I've seen, has more dedicated fans than any book I've ever worked on or any uh, anybody else's book I've come across. There are fans of that book that were the right, they were the children that she was writing for. They were grown-ups at the time who loved it. And it it is so charming that it's just a, it's just fabulous. Just it's a, really a masterpiece of of kind of out of the kids' books that Wheezy had loved as a child mm -hmm. and, and taken that inspiration and turned it into a comic. So I I I I mean, I'd probably pick some other ones as well, but I have to settle for one. I'll take power back. Cool. For you, I would have, I would have a really hard time. Golly. Um, you know, I your Thor was brilliant. Um, maybe X Factor, because I worked on uh, who knows? I mean, a great writer. It was great. Uh, golly, honey, I don't know. Is I sorry, 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 person who asked that question. It's really <laughs> hard to say. Um, you know, I I, your FF was so insane, particularly that time trap time, time bubble fight. and the time fight with Doom. The time fight with Doctor Doom was yeah, wonderful. I like that one. So it's it's really, it would be hard for me to say to really pick a favorite. I think, um, you know, maybe maybe Thor because I spent a lot of time. Maybe heck, maybe Manhunter because I met you because of Manhunter. That's right. Ah. That's right. Who knows? I you you just you have a series series of this brilliant work that's really hard for me to even choose. I think. Well, I've been lucky in some stuff I've done. I'll say that. I will say one of my personal favorites. I I I wouldn't be able. I mean, if I pick one favorite of my own stuff, probably Manhunter because that made me professionally. I know. And so from the nostalgia point of view, and also working with Archie was such a treat. Um, mm -hmm. I worked with a lot of other fabulous writers. And yet there was something in working with Archie, the two of us together, that I, I can't even describe, where we had a synergy together that was just magical. And we, I think we both felt it. But I, one of the books that I'm not, a, not as well known for, but I really like the work in it, is Orion. I did for two years for DC. Out of the oh, yeah, that's a brilliant one. And I, that, I love the Jack Kirby stuff. I love the fourth, the fourth world stuff. 
from DC is probably my favorite Jack Kirby work because it was just Jack unleashed. Um, it was nutty. Um, it wasn't written as user friendly as something that say Stan would have scripted. Mm -hmm. um, and there were a lot of characters where it's like, hi, I'm Claudia Shane, girl, girl secretary. I'm Biff, Biff blaster boy reporter. I'm, you know, whatever they were, they were like, they were like funny hats with names on their, you know, on their, uh, in the crown of the hat. Um, and yet there were moments where Jack just unleashed a sort of a fury um, and a power. I mean, he, he was known for power. He was phenomenal power. But he did, in, in terms of character, with Orion, uh, after Orion has fought Calabac, I've quoted this, or I've said this scene before, he fights Calabac in New York City and uh, defeats him, but he's pretty badly beaten up himself, which I also like. I, it's not like it was an easy victory or anything like that. And at the end, he's got a moment where he steps out into a balcony and starts screaming to the heavens, and there's all this Kirby crackle flying everywhere, everywhere around him. And he's screaming at his father at dark side to not stay in the shadows, but to come out and face him. And it's just this incredible scene. Yeah. And I don't know that that Jack and Stan would have been able to achieve that. It was just uh, maybe because it was so inside Jack. Frank Miller told me, we were, used to be office mates a million years ago, and Frank and I were talking about this once, and he thought that the fourth world stuff, maybe he didn't think this now, but he thought at the time that they were almost the first independent comics. They weren't really independent because they were, you know, DC published them, but right. they were so personal and so much the view of the creator of that material. I thought that was, that, that was a good point. I thought about that work. Yeah. So it's, I love that work. I love doing a Ryan where I got to go back and play in that sandbox. Yeah. And you, you uh, did a story with a character that I created. The uh, Green, oh, the Green Lantern. Lantern? Yeah. The uh, yeah. Raker, Raker Corridor. Yep. That was Corridor, fun. Yeah. That was fun. I had to go back and read up on that stuff. But, uh, and I, I still have some questions about the story logic of having them stuck on Apocalypse or the Guardian sticking them there. But I still <laughs> thought, I thought it was a great idea and a great well, Guardians were dicks, let's face it. <laughs> well, they, yeah, I guess they were. Apparently they were. But uh, I love putting his, his, time, his battery in like a little time stasis so he could kind of take that hour of, of power and kind of use little teeny bits of it. To yeah, do yeah, stuff yeah. There. So that yeah. was fun. That was a lot. It was fun to draw too. That guy, and I liked yeah. his interaction with Orion. I think that worked out really well. I, I, I don't gave know where I came. I don't know if one of my somebody I knew suggested the character, or I just I may have stumbled across one of the comics. I don't remember yeah. anymore. But yeah, but he just seemed to be perfect for the story I wanted to tell. Yeah, I, I I was thrilled to see that. That was really cool. Um, I know there's other questions here, but my screen has frozen on the comment section. So fan, <laughs> you you folks out there. Uh, I can't even scroll through uh, to see. I wonder if I can see anything on ours, if they're all frozen. Do I hit private chat? Is that what I hit up in the corner? Uh, no, uh, comments. Comments. Oh, there's comments. I see it. Oh, yeah. okay. I see lots of comments. Well, the last comment I got is from like like two seconds ago. So, okay. uh, well, don't know that. No. We are adorable legends, honey. I just want you to know that this somebody said that. Sure. Yes, they did. Um, I saw that one. Oh, Robocop and Henry was great. Well, I like that one too, actually. I thought that was it was fun to work with Frank. It was fun to draw those characters. They were a pain in the ass. Um, they there were vinyl models. This is how you, you do in comics. There were vinyl models, large, you know, maybe a foot high, of uh, Robocop and Henry by different companies. And uh, both John Byrne and Art Adams are model builders in different ways. And both of them, one of them had, I don't remember which one was which now, one of them had built a Terminator and one had built Robocop. And they very kindly loaned me those models, these large scale models, so I could draw from them. And I went off and I bought the unbuilt models. I just bought the kits, which I think I still have. But that way I could take Robocop's head and actually turn it uh, on a, uh, where am I? There I am. I could turn it for a down, an upshot that I couldn't really get on the completed model. You couldn't get underneath the head enough. So between those models, built and unbuilt, and other, some other reference I had, it made it much easier to draw those characters. I had a lot of reference, good reference, thanks to John and Arthur. But, but working with Frank was a treat as well. That was really a lot of fun. That's cool. Uh, I don't know. I don't see a lot of questions here. Midgard Serpent Issue. Tell them a story about the Midgard Serpent Issue. 
Oh, oh, well, the, the going to the cantina. Um, I knew I wanted, when I was doing Thor for Marvel, I knew I wanted to do a story with the Midgard Serpent. And the problem with the Midgard Serpent, and I do this to myself all the time as a writer, is I give myself stuff to draw that's completely out of scale. So the Midgard Serpent in Norse myths circles the oceans all the way around the world. And so he's that big. And I have to draw him with a god size, you know, human sized god, which is a little tricky. So I didn't make him as enormous as I might have, but I saw to get him all on the panels. So I, but I, I didn't know how I was going to, what that story was going to be like. So how can I tell this story? And I, you know, this giant, there's this giant epic fight between Thor and the Midgard Serpent. And in the Norse myths, at the end of that fight, they mutually slay each other. Thor kills the Midgard Serpent with his hammer. And as the Midgard Serpent dies, it gushes forth this effluvia, whether it's the blood or the poison from the creature, whatever it is, and it floods over Thor and he dies. It takes, it takes I think it's nine steps backwards and then drowns or dies in the poison. And I wasn't going to kill him. I had a mortgage to pay. So I wasn't really going to kill the character on a permanent basis. But I did want to do that story in some form. And I didn't know how to do that big a story and yet still make it, you know, in one issue, because two issues would be kind of boring. It really, so how, how I could put all that in one issue. And so I had all these different ideas. Well, I could cut away to like some subplots and then, you know, you come back to the fight and then back to a subplot and back, and then it sort of feels longer. And I went through a series of solutions. I just didn't, I wasn't happy with. And uh, one day we were eating, we we're on the living on the West side, West 71st street at the time. And there was a restaurant on Columbus and uh, 70th called the Cantina, a Mexican restaurant we used to go to a lot. And we were there one day. It was a summer evening, roughly. We went there for dinner. And on the way out, I because mean, I was thinking about this summer, I don't even know how it happened. But literally, as I walked out the door over the threshold of the cantina and took a step down onto the sidewalk, I suddenly went, all splash pages. And it was the only time I can remember well, I did feel like a light bulb had gone off over my head, literally. And I was so excited by the idea that I made Wheezy walk around a few extra blocks before he we went home. It was twilight. It's like nice long summer evenings that you get at seven o'clock in the evening. And we walked around for about three or four blocks. But I thought about what I could do and how I could make that work. It would give me big panels so I could put a small human figure and a large serpent in some form together. And I decided eventually, maybe right then, I don't know, I decided to write captions for the story. And I wrote them in faux Viking verse. The Vikings didn't leave any real pictures, but they left poetry or poetry that came, that was written down sometime later. I don't know how much of it survived right from the period. But there were ways that they wrote poetry. And it's not rhymed. It's stress, stress syllables. So you're not going to end up sounding like there once was a man from Nantucket who's, you know, it's not going to be like that. And uh, I said, if it's going to be bad, at least it'll be stressed. And so I wrote poetry for the captions. And part of the reason for that, at least for me, is that if I read poetry, I can't read it the way I read books. I can't just bomb through it. I almost have to read it out loud in mm -hmm. order to get any sense out of it. Yeah. And so I figured with these giant panels, you could just go flip, 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 and you were done. But um, if you're going to read it, you'd have to read it more slowly, and it would slow down the pace of going through this all splash page issue. And I did, I did manage to persuade Jim Shooter, who was the editor, mm -hmm. to let me do two extra pages in that book, which is very unusual. I got, I deleted the letter column, and I think probably the bullpen page, which they didn't like to do because that was the advertisement for other books. But they let me do it, so I did a 24-page story for that one issue, and uh, and it worked out. It worked out well. I, I thought that worked out nicely. I got Sal Sal Buscema was drawing the book by that time, and I I hated to do it because I really liked Sal. I didn't want to take any money away from him, but I I he was very graciously let me pencil that issue, and he inked it, and he got credit for inks over fit over layouts rather than over pencils. Because at that time, that meant that he got a slightly larger part of the royalties, I think. But it also meant his page rate was a little bigger. The way Marvel used to do it is if you had did layouts, you got 20 bucks less than your page rate. 
-hmm. and the anchor, the finisher, he got 20 bucks more than his usual page rate. So it would have given Sal a little more of the money I was taking away from him by drawing the issue. And then at the end of that, he very kindly gave me his half of the pages as well. So I have the entire issue myself. And I was, it was really kind of him. And I'm, it was, I was thrilled to work with him and he was, you know, came out pretty well. Oh, that's awesome. Now my wife was kind enough to bring down a iPad so that now I can see all the, the stuff. <laughs> oh, <It's> my... <laughs> you can probably catch up faster than me. I, <laughs> I, uh, Oh, see. Somebody read me. someone asked power pack was before me. Would my seven year old son enjoy it? Yes. Oh, I think so. I think he would. Um, I'm I'm finding that that I'm I'm still hearing from people because Power Pack has now been collected in all sorts of graphic novel formats, and their their kids are reading it. And it looks like you know the minute kids learn to read, they actually seem to be able to read Power Pack and seem to be enjoying it. I hope you like it. Try them. A lot of kids have. I mean, it's it was really a book that a lot of adults have come up to us at conventions up to Wheezy and told her how much they liked the book when they were seven or eight or nine. Yeah, they were I know. Young, it was, it was so great. Because at the time, um, we couldn't tell. I couldn't tell if kids were reading it. I knew adults were. I mean, I had written it with kids in mind, um, but not written down to them. It was stories about uh, kids having adventures. and um, uh, But the letters pages, we would uh, we would. We the only way that we knew who was reading a book was from the who was sending us letters more or less, yeah. and um, I would get a lot of letters from adults, but not letters from children. So I really thought children weren't reading the book, weren't finding it. Sure. But then I found out later from talking to fans that yes, they were that a lot of people had read it when they were children. So that pleased me. Somebody so, wanted yeah. to know if C three PO in my Star Wars book was patterned after the original poster of the character. I don't, I don't think so. I don't, I mean, I'm not really sure. It's a long time. I just, I went out at the time, I went out and bought every Star Wars book I could get. The kids' books, the growing up books, the scripts that had all these drawings inside. And I used those. I would have used those for 3PL. Although I did actually have a little, uh, I guess one of the figures that they put out in kind of a chromed uh, metallic gold and I would have used that a great deal. I mean, I had to I had to add the extra details in the arm and those little strap, the little pistons that went across the arm, stuff like that. I would have used that a lot, but I would have used whatever photographs I had for the really close up details on the face. So I don't think it came out of the poster per se, or it may have in some drawings and not in others. It's possible that the reference wasn't consistent all the way through. Yes, uh, I'm not really good at consistency. Somebody wants to know what your, what your inspiration was Ray to Ray built. Um, you know, that's too long a story to tell here. Um, okay. i tell you what, if you're on this, uh, if you're on Facebook, what you can do, I have a page called the official Walter Simonson page on Facebook. You go search it. All you have to do is like it. It's just one of these things that anybody can like. Um, I have a personal page where I only friend people I actually know. So please don't friend me on that. You won't hear from me, but the, it's almost a mirror site, but the, the official page, there are things called notes. And in the notes, you can write little essays about stuff. I wrote an essay about the design of the Tropicana orange juice carton when they changed it a few years ago and did a really god-awful job with it. And then I have to say, not because of my note, they changed it back. So there were things like that. But there is on there, if you search, there aren't that many of them, a dozen or more. But there is a note that details, I say by note, it's a bunch of paragraphs. It's not like five sentences that details the origin of Beta Ray Bill, that says the whole thing, really the whole deal. The short version, I will say, is that I had the idea to have somebody else pick up Thor's hammer. And that's because when I wrote that book, nobody else had. In 1983, book had been around for 20 years, nobody else had picked up Thor's hammer. So I wanted to create a character from the ground up who could do it. And part of what went into that was that I wanted to make the character look like a monster. That's because back then, comics weren't being reprinted much. A few here and there, but not much. And so mostly you bought the comic, it was on the stand for a month, it was gone, unless you bought it from some guy in his mom's basement or one of the very few comic shops around, you didn't see it again. So you tried to write and draw 
almost in symbols in order to cram as much meaning into the job as you could get. And mostly back in those days, bad guys were ugly. There was an ugly guy. He was almost certainly a bad guy. Good guys were all really handsome like me. So basically, I thought about making Bill a monster and where I should go with that. I, I have a degree in geology. I spent a lot of time in a museum that had a bunch of skeletons in it, uh, a mammoth, woolly mammoth, a mastodon, but things like that. And they had a, a complete modern horse skeleton. They also had horses through evolution from little hierarchitherium on up. It was a great exhibit. And the horse skull has teeth out in the front and then a gap behind those teeth. I think that's where the bridle goes when you put the bit in the horse's mouth. And then, and then some teeth behind it. But it's a very unusual face. It's a great face. And so I use that as a basis for Bill for two reasons. I mean, I didn't try. I didn't go back and study the horse skull and draw it up. I just put the teeth out in front, put the gap behind there. Most people, when they draw the jaw, don't draw. They draw like a real jaw and, and, and it goes back. But it's not really like that. It's this circle. I don't know how it works. It's a comic. I don't have to worry about it. But uh, the two reasons I did it, one, skulls have not an affinity for what's the word I'm looking for. Uh, they're kind of related to death. When you see a skull, death is one of the things you think of because that's how we all end up. Mm -hmm. At the same time, any skull, not this one because this one's plastic, but any skull, this is the basis for beauty. Not every human being comes out beautiful, but the ones that are, and in some ways all humans are beautiful, that's the basis, that's the structure for what makes beauty. So by giving Bill an underlying skull, for in a sense, for his structure, I wanted to capture both that affinity for death, that relationship with death, as in a monster, and I wanted to suggest, nobody thought of this, but this is where I'm thinking, that he was a, in his own way beautiful. Mm -hmm. He was a, he was a good soul. He had to be a, he had to be a worthy soul to be able to pick up the hammer. And I wanted that to be part of the underlying meaning of the drawings I was doing. Whether anybody knows the, that or not. I mean, most of you do the drawings, probably same in the writing, at least for me, when I'm trying to do the drawing in a comic, I am trying to tell a story that I would like to read. The same way when if I tell Graham a joke, I'm not going to tell Graham a joke I don't like. On the off chance, maybe he'll think it's funny. I'm going to tell him a joke I think is funny. He may think I'm an asshole after that. Or he may think it's kind of a funny joke. Right. But that's what that was about. And that's where that part of how Bill looks. The other thing I'll say is that he got kind of his weird Thor costume, which they've gotten rid of now. But he got it because back then, when Bill strikes the stick and turns into Thor, having his, uh, the hammer, that's a shortcut. In other words, when I did it, I didn't have to put a caption in that said, hey, look, this guy suddenly has Thor's powers. He got the, you know, the, the, the hammer acted like a tailor. It remade his clothes. And everybody who read that book and knew about it knew what the character was like. Went, oh, my God, this monster has Thor's power. And I got letters from people that were just furious how I'd screwed up Thor. You screwed this up. Don't you know how this really works? And my hope was, and it seemed to work out pretty well, they would all have to come back to read the next issue in order to castigate me for screwing up their favorite character. And it did. The sales picked up quite a bit, so it worked out pretty well. Wow. That's, that's great. a short version of Bill. That's that's a short version. <laughs> yeah, you feel a long one. <laughs> Sorry. Well, guys, uh, we've run an hour and 15 minutes now. Oh. Uh, and it's been awesome having you guys on and talking about uh, your careers and and, and uh, uh, your approaches to storytelling. I think everybody was really thrilled to see you on here. Uh, I see on the iPad here, there's plenty of stuff I'm going to have to read later. <laughs> once I oh, come hey, Brett, my Brett here too. Hey, Brett, how you doing? Brett <laughs> Levins has stopped by. Oh, oh hey, Brett, Brett, you know? At least he did. He's saying you may still be there. Okay, we Brett, I gave, I gave earlier, you some props, so... <laughs> you'll have to play it back and hear hear all the good things we said about you. <laughs> well, but, uh, I, yeah. I so, think, are we out of time, really? I have one more question I could ask Wheezy. Go ahead. Yeah, somebody asked you, said, Louise, how, whoop, no, somebody, oh, how was your run in Superman? Any good stories? Uh, well, they were all good stories. <laughs> joke, joke. <laughs> um, well done. 
<laughs> my run on Superman was amazing. Um, it was it was a different experience for me being part of such a large creative group. I mean, we each Superman book was treated as a chapter, and we so that sometimes. Oh dear, it's a very long, long. This is a long, <laughs> a long answer. Um, every year, all the Superman guys would get together, and this is this includes everybody from the letters and the colorists to the editors to the writers and pencilers and inkers. We'd have this huge meeting uh, with a big blank board, and we would fill in the continuity for a year's worth of stories. Um, you know, we would throw ideas at it and Mike Carlin could kind of, he was the guy, the arbiter, the guy who would say which ideas stuck. And then those would get lettered on the board and this, those would be the stories we would do, two-parter, three-parter, you know, whatever. And as the stories fell, you would end up doing the first chapter, the second chapter, the middle chapter. Um, so it was, it was a very different way of working. It was like, I mean, coming into it was like, like, like a skip rope that went around and around and around. And I had to jump into it fresh. And at first, you know, just out of the blue. And it took me probably about six months to, to understand how it really all had to work. But then it was wonderful. I, you know, we, we, we did some great stories. I, I think the Death of Superman story was, um, was really, it was really a good story. It was a good story that went on for about three years. Um, and speaking of six-year-olds, again, someone earlier had asked about if their six-year-olds, seven-year-old, I guess, would like Power Pack. That story, the Superman story, was, I thought the death of Superman was really violent. Um, not that I objected to it, but I felt a little guilty because I knew there were kids who watched Superman or who read Superman. And you have these two people that are literally beating each other to death. Mm -hmm. this monster doomsday and you've got Superman and they're pounding each other until one of them dies. And I thought, Oh my God, they're going to be children in America who are traumatized by this. I will have, I'm going to get letters <laughs> from, from, from psychologists accusing me of, I don't know, destroying the youth of America. Um, and so that now I, I of course have the chance to talk to fans who read the book you know, back in the day when it was written, which was a long 30 years ago, it was a long time ago. Um, and I say, so how old were you when you read it? Oh, I was six years old. So were you trying? I said, oh no, I loved it. That sold me on comics. And I went out and bought all these comics and it was like, oh, okay, I guess I didn't destroy it. I guess you children are tougher than I think they are. <laughs> well, you know, what's well, fascinating that. is that, is Somebody that asked working on the Batman that. books at the same time with for the breaking of Batman's back and those and two so editorial groups did not know the other one was doing what they were doing. That wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. I mean, I mean so we were doing the same thing. We had the meetings with the, the, the boards and we were mapping out everything that was going on about the nightfall. There yeah, you go. I would say, I'd like to give credit where Chris, somebody asked, he heard Mike Carlin was difficult. And I was about to say that Mike Carlin was the guy, it was like running at five different teams of horses or at least four. There was a fifth book, Superman occasionally all wanting to go in different directions. And Mike mm -hmm. was a master at getting all those teams to run the same way. Yeah. It doesn't, you know, it was just, we used to could speak more to that. I mean, nobody, was, nobody uh, Mike could have done it. I think he was just brilliant at that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He was the man. He just, was really the man who made it happen. Yeah, and and you had to coordinate all of that information. Because I was, you know, you would, everybody was doing a plot. And you had to, first of all, you had to get your work done in a week at a specific time. Mm -hmm. You couldn't, you know, take an extra time and goof off because everybody else depended on you. So you had to get your work done and then the work would go into the office and the assistant, Mike's assistant would Xerox everything and you would get this big, big <laughs> package every week of all the work that everyone had done on the their previous week of story. So every week, I mean, it was just, it was masterful. Um, I, I, I kind of wonder who came up. I think Mike must have come up with this insane idea and it really worked. I mean, it was, it was, it was a fun way of working for a while. For, somebody, um, and somebody um, has commented, we said, I am one of those children that read that as a kid back, the, back in the nineties. It didn't traumatize me. I loved it. 
but I cried when Lois held Superman's body. It was the equivalent of Bambi's mom dying. Oh, <laughs> oh that's sweet. <laughs> That's we fantastic. should probably let Graham go. <laughs> Sorry, Graham. I, well, I'm, I'm, I'm just afraid that my, my computer now has completely frozen up. You guys are still, I can you hear you and you're moving and everything else, but nothing else moves on the screen. <laughs> I'm not oh, even no, sure you're moving for without, without yeah. shutting it down. You're, you're doing just fine. You're, we can hear you and you are moving. <laughs> you are moving That's at this end. the only thing. You know, I, I, I can't access anything. Um, in fact, I think That's to get out of this stream, I'm going to have to uh, shut the computer down. <laughs> yeah, I think you will. Here's one question about that when you do, which is when this runs on your, stays in your YouTube, YouTube channel, so you can go back and look at it again, all these questions still going to be along the side? I believe so. Okay. Yeah. I wouldn't mind running through the comments, but it's, it's, it's hard to talk and look at the comments at the same time. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But my fans like to joke because uh, they have a drinking game when, when Graham has a technical issue. Uh, <laughs> because <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll swipe my mouse and, and I'll knock myself out of the screen and I'll have to come back in and they're like, oh, drink. <laughs> but folks, this is not my fault. This is the computer now. So there you go. You, you're not allowed to drink. So, well, listen, Merry Christmas to everybody. Yes. All you Merry Christmas, watching, you guys. Ma'am. Yeah. Merry, and Merry thanks. Christmas. A happy holiday. A happy, safe holiday for everybody. Right. And and thanks so much, you guys, for coming on. I really, really appreciate it. It's so great to talk to you. And uh, I hope we can see each other in person pretty soon when this is all over. Uh, yeah. so. You and us both. Yay, vaccine. Yeah, yeah really yeah. vaccine. Go for it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Have a great night. All and right. We'll Take care. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Oops. Okay. I'm not sure if we're out or if maybe Graham just disappeared. I don't know. Do, can we make ourselves go away? I think I'll just go ahead and close the screen. That should do it. You're right. Bye. Bye-bye, Cheryl. I'll see you later. Mm.